Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about an um, evaluation of the removal of ATMs from um, gaming venues in Victoria, Australia. So I'd like to um, acknowledge my co-investigators and co-authors for this presentation, which came from, who came from Swinburne University and one who's now at the Australian Institute of Family Studies as well. Um, funding for this research was provided by the Department of Justice, um, Victorian government, so they built in this evaluation into this implementation, which is something that you know, we really want to encourage for all and any um, harm reduction measures that we actually build in this type of evaluation, which I'll be talking about. And I need to acknowledge that the views expressed in this paper are those of myself and may not um, reflect the views of the Institute or the Australian or indeed Victorian governments. Okay, so it's just a bit of background. Um, gambling, we know that issues are likely to stem from a variety of interrelated factors, and those might be about factors about the person, um, some vulnerabilities around the person, factors around the social or situation of the individual, um, factors around the environment, and indeed around the gambling product itself. So we think that they come from a variety of these things, and they're, they're all interrelated. But governments who have a role to play in terms of some of this minimising of harm are more likely to target environmental factors or factors around the product itself because they're more easy for the um, governments to actually impact, much less likely to be able to impact factors around the individual themselves. And if they can do this effectively, then it can perhaps serve to make a product or the environment somewhat safer or at least less harmful for the person and encourage them and enable them to actually self-manage their gambling. But as I said, we really need systematic evaluations of harm reduction measures in order to see whether they're effective. And there was um, a couple of presentations that were on yesterday that talked about that and uh, that quite often measures are implemented without really these systematic evaluations happening. These need to happen in order to see whether the measure is, ex is in fact effective. Who is it, how effective is it and to whom? Often we can have measures that we think should be effective, but they may not be effective for a number of reasons. We also need, I think, to measure some of the costs and consequences associated with these implementations so we can see whether the costs are reasonable, comparative to the effectiveness of the intervention and see who's bearing the costs and look at any unforeseen consequences. If we do we find evidence of effectiveness of um, implementations and measures, then this can actually support a more widespread rollout of the measure. Yes, it's working, we can put it in, in many other different jurisdictions. Also, this type of evaluation can prevent widespread um, in implementation of interventions which are actually found to be minimally effective or unrealistically costly. Also importantly, an evaluation can actually inform on what aspects could be improved. So what tweaks need to be made in order to ensure that this is actually as effective as possible and to minimise unforeseen consequences and costs where possible. So in Victoria, what happened in 2009, some legislation was introduced that specified that as of July 2012, ATMs could not be located within 50 metres of a gaming area in a casino or race course, and that they can't be located in any other licensed gaming venue. Basically what that meant was that the ATMs had to be taken out of the venue altogether for all the pubs and clubs around um, Victoria, and there's over 500 of those, but that they could still be in the venues for the casino, the Melbourne casino and racecourse venues that had, um, you know, the, the races, so that they were exempted, but they still had to be 50 metres outside the gaming room, which was generally what was um, legislated beforehand. The other thing to keep in mind in terms of context here is that um, Prior to the removal, ATMs actually had daily limits on them in Victoria, so you could only withdraw up to $400 a day, only $200 per transaction, only $400 a day, and that uh, regulation remained in place for the casinos and the racecourses. For FPOS, FPOS um, facilities were generally available within venues. They also had $200 per transaction limit, but no daily limit, and FPOS was allowed to remain within the venues. Prior to the implementation, um, FPOS generally was not used as a means of accessing cash. People tend almost always use the ATMs and in fact most venues did not allow cash withdrawals from the FPOS. You could use, unless you were doing it for um, meals or alcohol, something like that, some of them would, but otherwise they couldn't. And this changed with this change in legislation, what people were doing. Okay, so the, 
feeding into the, de the decision to actually undertake this measure, this was actually there was quite considerable evidence to suggest that this would actually be effective, unlike as was discussed yesterday for some of the others. Research that had been conducted beforehand was quite consistent in showing that people who had problems were much more likely than others or non other gamblers or non-gamblers to access ATMs at the venue, to do so on a regular basis and to do so on multiple occasions within a single visit. So going back to the ATM to get out more money, going back to the ATM to get out more money. Um, there was also evidence uh, that um, venue-based withdrawals were often used to fund gambling and that this association was stronger for higher risk gamblers. Problem gamblers and counsellors also reported that this easy access to money within a venue was an important contributor to, to gambling problems. So the evidence was there, theoretically, this should work. And so it was implemented. So, but what, in terms of doing this, this of course does not guarantee success. So people may choose to circumvent the system, and this was discussed quite often at stakeholder interviews that I did prior, that some people may choose, switch to the FPOS system to access money in venues, uh, now that they can't get it from ATMs, and or may use external ATMs, so go around the corner and find an ATM to get money out, and or may bring more money with them into the venue. So people may actually just choose to get around the system. So we need to actually look at this in terms of whether, how effective it is and to measure costs and um, unintended consequences. So this presentation is going to just touch on some of the key findings. It was a very big study. I can't get through all the findings, but I'm going to touch on some of the key ones um, around this. So we did have multiple sources of data and I won't go into this in data because I just don't have the time. But basically we gathered data beforehand, took, did some interviews with key stakeholders and some problem and ex-problem gamblers beforehand. We had a very large pre-post implementation survey with um, patrons and post implementation interviews with patrons, so mixed methodologies. With <coughs> venues we did that as a one post implementation survey and interview with <coughs> venue respondents to try and minimise the amount of um, time of we were consuming from them and we did some other data gathering as well. For this today what I'm going to do um, primarily is draw on the findings from the pre-post patron survey which was conducted with 928 patrons, 82% retention rate, um, that 6% females and with the semi-structured interviews that were done with 30 patrons as well as some um, data from venue respondents and so there was we invited all 514 venues to take part in the survey. We got 164 who completed at least one question, 84 who got through to the last question, so they may not have answered all. So we didn't get as good a response as we wanted to, but not too bad, except for some of the questions, as I'll talk about. And we did interviews with 15 venue respondents. So in terms of the patrons, this was the main source of data, obviously, in terms of effectiveness. So we had quite a good mix in terms of um, low, no risk gamblers um, using PGSI, so around 60% of those, but over 20% moderate risk and nearly 20% problem gamblers, obviously oversampling the higher risk in order to see the effectiveness for these groups. And um, we had a small group of non-AGM gamblers and that was really just to articulate on, on potential costs for people who weren't gambling there but we still had the um, no ATM access after this. Uh, and the semi-structured interviews, again, oversampling the higher risk groups in order to articulate on harms and um, effectiveness. Okay, so in terms of money spent on um, EGM, so that being really the, um, the prime measure that you can actually use to measure effectiveness of, of this measure, was it reducing the amount of money that people were spending and particularly was it reducing the amount of money that people at higher risk were spending? And what we found was that, yes, there were significant decreases in the amount of money that those who were... Um, identified as a problem gamblers by the PGSI were spending um, at time two compared to time one, so after implementation compared to before, and that amount of money on average dropped by about $90 for um, at hotels and about um, $43 for the um, at the clubs. Tend to be um, less spent at the clubs than the hotels. Quite large um, variability around those numbers, but those two were significant. Um, no significant differences between the, for the other groups. So basically those at higher risk were the ones who were tending to spend much less after the implementation than beforehand, which is what you want. Less impact on those who were, um, had less issues in, identified in terms of their gambling. And importantly, no significant differences between time one and time, time two, money spent at the race courses and at the casinos on AGMs where the ATMs were still available. So you do see this differential pattern of behaviour happening at the venues where the ATMs had been removed. 
And this was backed up by the um, statewide expenditure data. So this is actually the expenditure data on EGMs across the state. So this is publicly available data. And what you can see there is the um, blue line is, is the 2011-12 data, so before the implementation, and the red line is the um, EGM expenditure data post. And you can see it drops by about 7% and that's fairly consistently maintained for um, that period right up to um, April. 2013 and actually we, I, we had another look at the data and it's still being maintained. There was a slight jump back up around the end of last year but that's gone down again. So it's basically been consistently maintained at around 7% drop in expenditure on EGMs um, since the um, removal of the ATMs. And interestingly we compared that to a couple of other states um, so you can and um, that same picture didn't happen. So South Australia, which is the um, red line there, actually only had a drop in expenditure across that same time period of about 2%. And in Queensland, in fact, there was a slight increase in expenditure across that time. And you can also, which I quite like, you can see those seasonal dips and troughs um, over the year, and that's fairly similar. So that's suggesting it's not more global factors that have led to this drop in expenditure over that time period. Okay, so in terms of the um, FPOS facilities, um, so what happened was, and, and the industry was actually quite open about this, so beforehand the FPOS facilities were sort of traditional FPOS facilities. You put in your um, identifying numbers, how much money you want, and someone will give you your cash um, back. When um, the ATMs were withdrawn, um, what happened with the industry was they actually changed that system. So whereas beforehand there were very few venues that actually allowed you to withdraw cash um, without a purchase, after the implementation all the venues that we looked at allowed cash withdrawals. And they put in these new machines that look very much like an ATM machine and usually were put in the same place as the ATM machine but had to have this face-to-face -face interaction. So you had to actually go up to a staff member, or you still do have to go up to a staff member, put in your numbers, ask for the cash, and then that they, after that your card will work in the machine or in some instances you're given a piece of paper and that can go into the machine and then you can get your cash. So it's sort of two-point um, systems. So you had to go up to the person, ask for the money, go somewhere else to get the money. Some clubs, smaller clubs particularly, were still maintained the old system where they actually took the money out of the, out of the drawer to give you, so one stage um, system, but most of them had these two stage systems and most of the people in the industry talked about that as being a safer option for them. So this bottom part of that machine, bottom part of an ATM, is actually working as a safe. So it was safer for staff to actually be able to load the cash when the venue was closed rather than when it was open is what they talked about. And this is important because when we looked at the qualitative data about, well, we've seen this drop in, in EGM, in um, expenditure on the venues, what is that about? Why did that happen? And one of the reasons that this was re retained was that that previous literature had suggested that if you've got this face-to-face -face interaction with a staff member that you will not withdraw as much money because you are on, under observation and that it enables staff to have some um, greater potential to identify people who are potentially having issues with their gambling if they're coming back again and again to take money out. And what we found with the qualitative data was, was in fact this case, that people would say, look, you know, this is a problem gambler who said, well, you sort of don't want to go up and access the FPOS the third time with your other card. I don't know whether they're trained to still say anything, whether they've been trained to. So one of the strong themes that came through was the fact that people did not like to be observed taking their money out and they would not go back again and again, particularly the higher risk um, gamblers. But even the low risk gamblers did not like being observed taking out the money and were actually quite reluctant to do that. They didn't tend to do that so often in any case, but they were less likely to do it afterwards. For some who did actually try, try to go, go out and access money elsewhere, just having that time break gave them some time to think about it and some of them were then saying that they were going home. So, oh, I'll go out to the petrol station and get cash, cash and once you're out there, you're out of the zone. And, oh, well, I might as well go home now. So this is one of the other things that if people are actually leaving the venue to access more cash is you've got that break in play that gives people a time to consider and think about things and, and some of them were actually then going home. Some of them also said that just having that time where they had to, they had to queue up to get the money or the two-stage system to within the money, they just go, you know, that was just too much hassle and they would go home. A small number did say that they had um, pre-planned now to bring more money in, which is what some people were saying, that for the higher risk gamblers, some of them were saying they were planning, they were bringing more money with them or they were going out to access more money when they were there. Both of these things allow 
do mean that people are actually having to think about this a lot more, though, than if you're just in the venue and going to an ATM that's just a few steps away. So it does mean that there's a bit more planning and thinking involved. But for some people, they were planning that, and for some people, they were, in fact, getting more money out because there was no longer a daily limit on the FPOS. And that's an important consideration. So now they could take out as much as their banks would allow. So for some, pro some people who are experiencing problems, and the <coughs> councillors' um, interviews back this up, they were actually taking out more money than they were beforehand. Okay, in terms of control, there was also some evidence that this, was, um, this uh, implementation was successful for people. So um, over 50% of those at moderate and high risk reported that, that the intervention had assisted them to manage spending subject subjectively. They felt that this was actually helpful for them. And almost 30% of the lower risk gamblers also said it was helpful. So they also felt like it was helping a tool that they could use to help them manage their spending. And we know that even people who are at low risk will sometimes spend more than they want to. Um, significant reductions in frequency of impulsive overspending for the high-risk gamblers, which is important. So less likely to actually take out money multiple times within a session. So at time one, there was around 44% of those um, classified as problem gamblers reported spending more than they had intended. At time two, that had reduced to 26%. And a significant de decrease in severity of symptomatology for those in that um, highest risk. So we actually used some of the items from the PGSI over a three month period for pre-post to see if there's some drop and the drop was there for the highest risk group. Qualitatively, the data again substantiated these findings. So most people reported that the removal had helped them in a sense of control and that they were less likely, that the impulsive overspending was more common beforehand because it was sort of this more automated process. It was so easy to go and you didn't really think about it much. Whereas now they had to think about things a lot more. Think about whether they wanted to spend that extra time to go and find more money the fact that people would be looking at them and they felt like they were being observed and that that, that interrupted their flow so that they did think about that a bit more. And again, this is the qualitative data suggested that that control, feeling of control was there for both high and low risk gamblers. So this is someone who came up as a low risk gambler who still said that, you know, my upper limit could always be stretched in the days when the ATMs were just there. It was really handy. I think that the FPOS is a great way to make people think about the next step. Um, and uh, before they actually take more money out. Um, for those who were experiencing problems, um, for this person, look, I do plan more. I, and so this person used it as a tool, and this was often the case. So she chose not to take any more money with her and deliberately chose not to do that, so that she only takes the same amount as she did beforehand, and then when she's run out, she was finding that she would, only, she would still go back to the counter to use the FPOS system, but it wouldn't, would only be once or twice. She'd be too embarrassed to go back there more because she'd be thinking, they're looking at her and thinking, you poor pathetic thing. So that had actually been a big plus for her. As I said, some people were taking out more money. Um, we also looked at, as I said, at the costs and consequences of this. So we um, surveyed those venues and did the interviews. Um, with the interviews, um, th so there was good variability in terms of the venue type, size and region, but as I say, um, fairly small samples, and particularly when we got to the money questions for the venues, and the interviews were gen all with people who were actually at that higher management level, so it may not be as representative of what people were seeing at the ground level, but we did ask some, some about that. Um, so the main adaptation was enhancement of the SPOS services, which we I talked about. Those sort of costs were actually fairly minor to the venues. The um, ATM providers generally covered the cost of removing the ATM machine, bringing back an FPOS machine. Um, aggregate downturn in revenue. So this was quite interesting because even though we only had, um, we had about 75, we had 75 people who responded to the um, EGM revenue question. And um, some of them, they could either say exactly how much revenue they had had in October 2011 or October 2012, or they could talk about percentage decrease or increase in revenue from 2012 versus 11. That's why I've got the, the range of data. But that EGM revenue basically said a drop of between 6 and 7.5 per cent, and that sits nicely around that 7.1 per cent <coughs> that we actually saw from the objective EGM revenue data. So we're fairly confident around that. The non-gambling revenue, um, we had um, 58 people respond to that, so fairly small numbers, so fairly strong caveats around this. Um, Non-gambling revenue drop of maybe between 5.2 and 7.1 per cent. The non-EGM gambling revenue, only 22 people responded to that question. So the number's there, it says about 7.4 to 7.8 per cent, but I really can't be confident about whether or not that it's accurate. But there is this general pattern of a downturn in revenue across the different kinds of, of 
gambling and non-gambling revenue reported by the venues. Interestingly, when you compare that to the patron data, they say that they were spending less on EGMs and not that much less on non-EGM gambling or non-gambling. There was also some evidence from the venue data that the venues that didn't have really close ATMs may be more, um, more negatively impacted revenue-wise than those that had the ATM around the corner. And there was also a small loss of income from ATM fees, but that was, that was really odd data. Some people said it went up, some people said it went down. It was, you know, so I'm not that confident about that particular data, but it was, wasn't a huge amount in any case. Um, the venues did also report um, some drop in patronage, and some of them said that they thought that was more actually about the casual drop in people rather than the regular customers who had adapted to, to the new regime. In terms of safety and attitude, there was no evidence of safety incidents at or around venues. So we didn't get any of the, pat any of the patrons or any of the venues reporting that there was any robberies or anything like that. Some people were worried about that. Patrons were generally split on whether ATMs um, should be um, in, oh, in venues or not, but they generally wanted FPOS services to be retained. So we asked them at both time points. Problem gamblers were more likely than others to say, get rid of it all. Um, the data did indicate a very little real inconvenience. People t weren't terribly inconvenienced. They knew there was a bit more hard work, but they weren't that inconvenienced. The general, the negative perceptions that we did pick up on were actually related to perceptions of ineffectiveness. So this was where patrons and particularly um, venue staff workers said, this was a whole lot of effort. You've given us a whole lot more work. It'd be all right if it was working, but I keep seeing these people taking out more money. They're taking out more money than they were before. So where they were seeing these the people who they thought had perhaps we're experiencing problems that we're taking more and more money out with the FPOS system, this made them really annoyed. So I think to give them back feedback that this is actually is working for a lot of people would be very helpful for both the patrons and the staff to actually feel like actually this is worthwhile. They didn't have a problem with this if they thought that it was going to work. So in conclusion, basically, there is clear evidence that um, the removal of ATMs does seem to be quite effective as a harm reduction and consumer protection measure that there were substantial and significant reductions and in both time and money for, uh, on AGM gambling, and this was, was more strong patterns in the higher risk gamblers than the lower risk. And there were increased feelings of control and reductions in impulsive overspending, again, particularly in the higher risk groups, but across all gamblers. Um, and generally, um, reporting of less time and money and more in increased money management for, those, um, for all the gamblers. The other thing that was really interesting, good was that there was really general coherence between the qualitative data and the quantitative data. And the qualitative I just found incredibly useful to give that context. So yes, we're seeing this drop. Yes, it's higher in the problem gamblers. Why? What is that about? And to really get that picture that it was, it was about that face-to-face -face interaction, which was what was expected to happen. So we were seeing that that was what was expected to happen and that any general negative feeling was actually about a feeling that perhaps it wasn't so helpful for certain groups. In terms of the costs and unintended consequences, yes, there definitely was reduced EGM revenue and some indication of some reductions in patronage. So there was some indication that there was slightly less visits and that people were spending less time playing the pokies while they were there. This is as expected and, in fact, if you're expecting it to, to work as a harm reduction measure, it's, it's sort of a desired outcome from a governmental perspective that that's what you want to happen. There was, did seem to be some impact on revenue in um, other areas of business, but the, I think that was probably less than the AGMs, but small numbers from the venue perspective, so tricky to tell, but the patron data was suggesting that that, that they, there wasn't as big a drop in the other areas. And most people had adapted. There were some unintended consequences, to some, particularly for the higher risk, some are higher risk gamblers who were spending more. And I think um, if we actually want to use this information to tweak it a bit, to make it more effective, that thinking, considering daily limits on FPOS, similar to what had been in place for ATMs, would actually assist those high-risk gamblers. And there was over 90% of, of people said, look, yeah, happy to have daily limits on FPOS similar to what had been there in ATMs. So people were, were really very positive about that type of thing. But as venues said, FPOS technology is actually older technology than ATM technology, and it's quite tricky to put in place those electronic daily limits on FPOS the way that they could have done that with ATMs. So that's something to take into consideration. But I think these findings can inform governmental policy at a national and international level. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. How nice to have a good news story to go to <laughs> Questions? Sir? Yeah, congratulations, Anna. That's thank you. Great.
Uh -huh. um, for self-reported expenditures, you report that the average is yeah. four and a half. Yeah. And as we know, uh, gambling expenditure is not normally distributed. We typically have a couple of outliers that are skewed mm -hmm. results. Uh, so do you have uh, values for the median change in expenditure for the group four and a half? I haven't got that in the report, but I can find that out. So I could find that out. I can't give that to you now. One thing we did find with that, which was um, something that was brought up by one of the stakeholders, was whether people were high spend per session versus low spend. And actually, you do find that significant drop is for the high spend um, people at, uh, who are having got problem um, experiencing problems with their gambling. But for people who are experiencing problems but are low spend per session, you didn't see that significant change. So again, it's, it's there for some, but not all of the high risk gamblers. We used um, Wilcox, on, yeah, Wilcox, yeah, it had a statistician on board who was telling me, no, don't do this, do this. Right, so the seven, so the seven percent. That's actually statewide data. So that's that. No, we can't divide that up between people. Um, we did divide up in terms of with the self-report data. So that was actually just self-report data on yeah. how much they were spending we typically. Yeah. yeah. To, to look. Charles. Potentially could do. I'd have to talk to my statistician on board about that. I did mention that. <laughs> From the 2001? Well, in that long term trend line. Yeah. I mean, it'd be useful to know that. Yeah, and yeah. The second, the second, in real terms. And the second question is there was a real change in the ownership structure of the venues mm -hmm. in that year, in what was captured entirely in the period that we're talking about. Mm. And there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that the intense marketing of, of machines, which had been conducted by the previous duopoly, had declined. Yeah. Did you take account of that or is it something that you should think about? We did the best that we could around that. In terms of the, I mean, if you look at the expenditure data for year on year, that isn't impacted by that venue operator model change because that's just the expenditure data. So that's, that's sort of aside from that. We did ask the venue um, venues about that as to whether they thought that this had, whether there was a differential impact. And some venues said yes, it was higher, and some venues said yes, it was lower, and some venues said no, not really different. So it was, and there were so few venues that actually responded to those questions, it was very difficult to disentangle. And there actually seemed to be some confusion amongst some of the venue respondents as to whether they were talking about that venue operator model or to, or with or without. So they didn't actually really, I don't think they really were able to unpick that themselves. Um, I think. Um, and so, yeah, so some venues seem to think this was an extra problem on top of that problem and that actually they were getting less money, money following the venue operator ch model change because they paid so much for these licences so that they were actually doubly impacted, whereas others were kind of like, yeah, well, you know, we had this drop but we got more money from this firm, so we're not really seeing the difference. So pick that up more in the interviews that some of them were, you know, would start um, the person that was doing the interview said it, he said it was really funny they'd go oh yeah we had that boss but you know we've got the venue operator model now so this is oh, so this is really good you know that sort of take you know so they'd sort of moderate themselves after a little while so they, he found there was clear indications between the lines if you like that they were feeling that they had recovered they were okay because of that so they were still getting a bigger slice so they were okay but others did feel it was a problem and it was I thought what was really interesting was that there seemed to be this differential impact for venues that were um, it was away from local ATMs that they really had seemed to have felt that hit harder. So that, that suggests to me that some people are actually going outside and, and accessing money or bringing more money with them. <laughs>
mm. and I couldn't put a limit on it. Mm. So you've got a certain mark and they have a limit of how much you can take. It's often they thought that they would... Um, so they could do that, but that's basically them saying, OK, you can only take this much out. Now, there, there is legislation in place that they can only take out $200 per transaction, but what staff were saying was we would have to watch and make, see whether you were coming back again to get 200 out and 200 out and 200 out and 200 out. And what they did say was that, which I didn't have time for, was some, some staff members, some people talked about targeting different staff members and even um, shift changes. So they'd wait for a shift change, target someone else so that they couldn't be seen. And at the same time, the staff were saying, we're watching them target the different staff members and shift change. So they were seeing things. And that was that's where I had a crossover to my other project because then they were actually not sure about what to do with that information. So as I said, some of them were quite angry about the fact that they could see people taking out more money than before and quite distressed about that and didn't really know whether they should be saying something or not saying something. And um, we asked a bit about that and some of them said, well, you know, if someone's coming up to me at, at the bar and there's other people at the bar, I'm not going to talk to them about the fact that I think they're taking out too much money. And so, you know, we were su suggesting that they, there could be um, an increase in the training around this for staff members around what to do with that information, how to integrate that with other information that they may have, um, knowledge and identif identifiers for people to actually do something about that and that it didn't have to happen at that time. But some venues were actually instigating their own additional training around that, so they'd actually had staff members come up and say, we want more training, we want to know what to do. Particularly people who may have not had anything to do with the gaming room prior, so actually weren't seeing what was happening, had no knowledge of that if they were on reception in a club, and now people were coming around to the reception to take money out, and they were seeing these people coming backwards and forwards. So yes, that was quite interesting. But that and that bit about the long-term trend on data, we didn't look at it going back to 2001, but that's quite an interesting extension that I think I'll look into. Any final A debit, you can't use credit cards in the venues, but you can at the ATM around the corner. And that was another thing that was brought up was that you've got, the, you know, whereas they had the $400 limit in a venue, that doesn't apply at the venue around the corner and you can use credit cards there. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, nothing quite like this in Vancouver on the current discussion after two years of neoliberal economic performance work. It's like being a room of people to listen to their appetite for regulation. <laughs> thank you very much.